last lecture of protein nucleic acid interactions of our module on protein macromolecular interactions, we will be looking at the interactions of proteins with RNA. We have visited the DNA RNA structure in the first of this three lectures on protein nucleic acid interactions. We looked at DNA domains and DNA interactions. In this lecture, we will be looking at protein RNA interactions, RNA binding domains, the importance of protein RNA interactions, and in this case, the large, last of the detection methods that we mentioned, the RNA's footprinting assay. In the RNA recognition motif, which is important in the interaction process, we will be looking at the several domains that are known, the double-stranded RNA domain, the K homology domain, the S1 and the dead box domains. And then we will look at specific proteins, RNA polymerase, the ribosomal proteins and ribonuclease. We had looked at the polymerase proteins when we discussed our lectures on motor proteins. When we look at protein RNA interactions, we understand that they are essential for a number of fundamental biological processes because we know that we have a central dogma of biology where we go from DNA to RNA to protein. So RNA has an extremely important role to play in this specific process. Proteins that can bind to the double or the single-stranded RNA are called RNA binding proteins or abbreviated as RBPs. What they do is they govern many aspects of RNA metabolism such as pre-mRNA processing, transport, stability, decay and translation. The RNA binding proteins are cytoplasmic and nuclear proteins because we realize that their importance in the specific processes that they are involved in, they have to be present at many places in the cell. They also participate in the forming of ribonucleoprotein complexes and mature RNA is usually extracted from the nucleus very quickly so that the R RNA binding proteins in the nucleus that exist as complexes of the protein and pre-mRNA, they are called heterogeneous ribonucleoprotein particles or HNRNPs. So this mature RNA that is present now has to be exported and the process involves the binding with several types of proteins. In the RNA binding domains, we have the RBPs. They exhibit highly specific recognition of the RNA targets by recognizing the sequence and structures. So we looked at the RNA structure. When we considered the RNA structure, we looked at pentose sugar, the D-ribose sugar, to which we had the phosphate and we had the nitrogenous bases attached. So the recognition of a specific sequence by the RNA binding proteins is important for any activity to occur in the specific activities, biochemical processes that are important. The RBPs therefore contain several structural motifs. There is an RNA recognition motif. There is the double-stranded RNA binding domain and a zinc finger motif and several others. We looked at the zinc finger motif in our previous lecture. When we look at the RNA recognition motif of the RRM, there are specific characteristics of the types of residues involved and more so structural importance based on domains in the protein that have specific secondary structures. So the domain in this case would be about 90 to 100 amino acids that are known to bind single-stranded RNAs. This is found in many eukaryotic proteins and it consists, as we can see, of four of these anti-parallel beta strands that are stacked along two of these alpha helices. So this is the specific recognition motif, specific domain 
it is referred to as the b beta alpha beta beta alpha beta now this recognition domain or motif is important to realize that the rna structure or the basis of the whether it is the backbone or the specific residues involved will be interacting with the recognition motifs that we have so these are the n and the c terminals and these are marked with the specific strands that we can see so there are four strands of the beta sheet anti parallel in nature that has we have the b1 beta 1 followed by an alpha followed by two beta an alpha and then another beta in the specific topology that has been mentioned here in the recognition motif then in another case we have therefore the single stranded bases that are specifically rec specifically recognized by the beta sheet and through the two loops that connect the secondary structure elements so we saw that we have four of these beta so these are the four strands that we have here and we have the alpha helices now in the recognition we have specific single stranded bases that are recognized so for any as we have seen before for any protein interaction for any protein ligand interaction the recognition is a major most important event that occurs so whether we are talking about a small molecule ligand or whether we are talking about a macro molecule we realize that the recognition is extremely important so the motif or the specific domain involved in the process has specific structural aspects to it has also specific chemical aspects associated with it that brings about this recognition for the specific function that it is involved in so the binding is usually mediated by several conserved residues it could be an arginine or a lysine residue that forms a salt bridge to the phosphodiester backbone we know that we have the sugar phosphate backbone and the bases attached to it also there are two aromatic residues that can make stacking interactions with the nucleobases so just like we studied the specific types of interactions that are possible there are hydrogen bonding interactions van der waals interactions electrostatic interactions as well as stacking interactions in this case with the aromatic residues that can be involved in static interactions with the bases the double stranded rna binding domains have a specific motif this is an alpha beta domain of around 70 to 90 amino acids and this is found in both bacteria and eukaryotes this plays a critical role in rna processing rna localization rna interference rna editing and translation activity so we realize the importance of the specific binding domain and these are large domains because they have specificity structural complementarity in the way they are going to bind with the specific ligand of interest in this case double stranded rna so this binding domain that we are looking at where we have our double stranded rna where we have our protein that is going to bind to the rna so it interacts with double stranded rna without making specific contacts with the nucleobases as we can see it is more near the backbone the sugar phosphate backbone so the rna binding protein in this case binds across two successive minor groups and the intervening major group so we have the minor group here another minor group here and this is the intervening major group that is on one face of the ds rna helix so this is our ds rna binding domain that recognizes the double stranded rna it does not make any specific contact with the nucleobases but nevertheless interacts with the backbone in a sense that it crosses over two minor groups and a major group in the face of the dna helix that we are looking at the double stranded rna binding domains are a majority of the intermolecular contacts here are sequence independent and they involve the two prime oh groups and the phosphate backbone as we can see from the nature of the interaction in this case another domain is the k homology domain 
each of these domains have their own characteristics as we can see. So this is our RNA molecule and this is our protein that has the specific domain that is going to interact with the RNA. This KH domain binds to RNA and it functions in RNA recognition. The domain again we can see is composed of a large amount number of amino acids approximately 70 and it forms a three stranded beta sheet packed against three helices which can be identified. The beta strands are marked in green and the three helices that we see here are marked with red. So the spe specific structural motif and the way the geometry of the strands in the beta sheet and the alpha helix are located is important in the recognition motif that we are looking at in the formation of this specific domain. The S1 domain is another domain that has been was originally identified in a ribosomal protein but was found in other RNA binding proteins as well. Again, this is composed of approximately 70 amino acids that are arranged in a five-stranded anti-parallel beta barrel that is capped by a short 310 helix. So the necessity of having these structural motifs, we realize, is in the recognition. So the domains are large in recognizing the RNA structure. The dead box domain is another domain that does not form contacts with the nucleotides, but again, interacts with only the backbone of the RNA. This domain usually uses an ATP dependent conformational change to coordinate RNA transient folding and remodeling. This is an extremely important aspect of several functionalities associated with RNA, the transient folding and the remodeling of the RNA that is brought about by an ATP dependent conformational change to the dead box domain. So if we look at the importance of protein RNA interactions, we realize that they have very crucial roles in various cellular processes, bringing from cellular function, transport, and localization. It plays a major role in the post-transcriptional control of RNAs, such as splicing, polyadenylation, mRNA stabilization, mRNA localization, and translation. So in all the translation and post-transcriptional processes, we have RNA. And RNA processing is very important, which means that we have the protein RNA interactions that need to be understood to modulate these processes. The examples of other proteins that interact with RNA are RNA polymerase, as we had seen, ribosomal proteins and ribonucleases. The RNA polymerase, as we have looked at before, is a multi-subunit, multi-unit enzyme that synthesizes RNA molecules from a template of DNA. So we have the DNA to RNA, the process of transcription, which takes us then to the protein in the process of translation. So this is the first step in the gene expression that involves an RNA polymerase interacting with our RNA. So when we look at the RNA polymerase, it has a core from the E. coli con that consists of five subunits. There are two alpha subunits of 36 kilodalton each, a beta subunit of 150 kilodalton, and a beta prime subunit, which is marked here. So we have the two alpha subunits, we have the beta subunit, the beta prime subunit, and then a small omega subunit, and a sigma factor that binds to the core forms the holoenzyme. After transcription begins, the factor then unbinds and lets the core enzyme proceed with its function. So we realize that the, there is a very tight regulation of the process that goes on. So we have this sigma factor that forms the holoenzyme. Then the factor will unbind and let the core enzyme proceed with its function that is in the preparation of or the synthesis of RNA from the DNA template. When we look at the ribosomes, we have these very large proteins. They are macromolecular machines that perform biological protein synthesis. We had mentioned this 
a specific macromolecular assembly when we spoke about other types of proteins in the motor proteins that we mentioned. The ribosomes themselves consist of two major components. There is a large and a small ribosomal subunit and each subunit consists of one or more ribosomal RNA molecules and many ribosomal proteins because it is the complete machinery that prepares the protein. The ribosomal proteins, therefore, is any one of the proteins that in conjunction with ribosomal RNA make up the ribosomal subunits that are involved in the cellular process of translation. So we have the DNA to RNA in the transcription process. Now we have the RNA going to the protein in the cellular process of translation and there is the involvement of RNA in both these processes. So the ribosomal RNA is a type of non-coding RNA, which is the primary component of these ribozymes. And it is ribosomes and RNA itself is a ribozyme, which we had talked about in our enzyme lectures, which carries out protein synthesis in ribosomes. So we have to this the large ribosomal unit and a small ribosomal subunit. These two subunits are important. So we can see the ribosomal RNA structure marked here and the ribosomal proteins structure marked in blue. And we can see how complex this, uh, well, how complex this formation is in the formation of the large ribosomal subunit and the small ribosomal subunit that together make up these ribosomal proteins. So in the ribosome, there are three RNA binding sites. They are the E. APE, if we go in that sense, the incoming tRNA binds at the A site, where A is for amino acid. We have then the peptidyl is the second binding site for the tRNA that holds the growing protein chain because we know that this is involved in protein synthesis. Then the E site is the exit site where the tRNA is removed after its function to deliver the amino acid is complete. So if we just look at a schematic of how this works, we have our mRNA, we have our unit with the EPA sites attached to it, and then we will have the amino acids tagged along with the specific tRNA that are then going to bind to the specific site here with the anticodon that is present. So without going into the details of the process, we realize that there is a translation occurring now. The translation of the encoded messages from mRNA that synthesizes the proteins from the amino acids in the formation of the growing polypeptide chain. So we would have the shift of the mRNA and the formation of the peptide bond and gradually the tRNA exit by delivering its specific amino acid cargo to the growing polypeptide chain. So as this continues, we have the growth of the polypeptide chain in the synthesis of proteins in the translation process that in, involves this very large macromolecular assembly, probably one of the most important ones in proteins that we will be looking at. The ribonucleases now are a set of proteins that catalytically cleave ribonucleic acid. Now, the importance of ribonucleases lies in this. So we have the RNA polymerase that prepares or synthesizes the RNA. And here we have the ribonucleases, which are rather RNA depolymerases that cleave the RNA. Now, the necessity of ribonucleases is to maintain a balance between the synthesis and the destruction of various RNAs. Is It can also remove any foreign RNA and is always and also toxic towards tumor cells. We visited ribonuclease A when we studied enzyme mechanisms into looking at how it cleaves the RNA. So the ribonuclease A protein is a very important protein that is one of the most well-studied proteins. It is one of the enzymes that helps or can digest RNA. 
It is an endonuclease that cleaves RNA in the middle of a strand and it is recognized by specific active site residues that then proceed for enzymatic cleavage, which means it will be able to digest RNA. There again are specific recognition sites. We have, as we have seen before in the enzyme classes, where we have a base recognition site, a sugar recognition site, and a phosphate recognition site. Knowing that the structure of RNA has these three components in the nucleotide, the sugar, the base, and the phosphate. So we have these specific recognition sites on the ribonuclease A protein that will then proceed with its enzymatic activity in the cleavage of RNA, a process that is necessary to maintain a very crucial balance between the synthesis of RNA and the destruction of RNA that is going to be brought about by the RNA polymerase and the destruction by the RNA depolymerase known as ribonuclease. There are other ribonuclease and each of these have, as we can see, a regulatory role to play. And these cells also need other tools to make precise modifications to RNA that are possible with these ribonucleases. For example, if the tRNA is too long in length, then they must be trimmed to the proper size to bring about their activity. Ribonuclease Z trims the end that accepts the amino acid residues. And we have ribonuclease P, which will compose of both protein components and a ribozyme that will trim the other end. So we realize the importance of having these ribonucleic acid depolymerases or ribonucleases. There are some others where we have the Z-dimeric enzyme, and this is the partial structure of tRNA where it is used to trim the tRNA to make it of the exact length required for its activity. Then we have ribonuclease 3 that wraps around sequences of RNA that form perfect double helices in a very compact structure. In the detection methods that we studied in the previous two lectures, we looked at electrophoretic mobility shift assay. We looked at the pull-down assay. And in this lecture, we will study the footprinting assay that is used for DNAs and RNAs. The RNAs footprinting assay is a technique that can detect nucleic acid protein interactions using the fact that a protein that is bound to the nucleic acid will protect the nucleic acid from any enzymatic cleavage, as we just saw. This makes it possible to locate a protein binding site on a particular RNA nucleic acid molecule. So the process involves the interaction of the nucleic acid with the protein. This complex is then cleaved with DNAs or RNAs, knowing that if there is a protein nucleic acid complex, this will be protected from the cleavage that is going to be brought about by a DNAs or a ribonuclease. We just saw that a ribonuclease cleaves RNA. However, if this RNA is protected by the interaction with the protein, then this cleavage will not be possible and the RNA will be protected. So this method uses the enzyme, the DNAs or the RNAs to cut a radio labeled NA. This is followed by gel electrophoresis that is going to detect the resulting cleavage pattern. And then there will be a pattern that would decide whether there is an interaction. So the DNAs or the RNA is a footprinting assay. The DNAs is used for protein DNA complexes and the RNAs is used for protein RNA complexes. So the protein that binds to an RNA sequence can protect the region of the RNA from any RNA's digestion. And the region that is protected is known as the footprint of the protein. So this makes it possible to locate the specific protein binding site on a particular nucleic acid molecule. The method uses, as I mentioned, RNAs to cut the end labeled RNAs with, our, with and without bound protein. This will be followed by the gel electrophoresis that would help in the detection of the cleavage pattern. So if we look at RNA without protein, and then we have the RNA with the bound protein. So this is where we have our protein RNA complex form. Now, we are looking at RNAs. What will RNAs do? RNAs will chop 
up the RNA at specific locations depending upon its specificity. So we will have fragments of the protein without of fragments of the RNA without the protein. But once the RNA is bound with the protein, the specific site will not be able to be cleaved. So we will miss a specific fragment. Then this cannot bind. So what we see is we see that we have the cleavage at these points, but no cleavage possible at this point because the RNA has the bound protein to it. So what we have now is two sets of proteins, two sets of samples, one where we have RNA without protein that has been treated with RNAs and one we have RNA with the bound protein also treated with RNAs. This is then subjected to electrophoresis. What we will see in an electrophoretic assay is that when we run the gel in our experiment with the in the presence of some nucleic acid markers, we will see a distribution, a migration based on the specific size. However, at the region where we do not have this specific fragment, we will see an absence which is known as the footprint. Because this is indicative of the fact that the protein has bound to the RNA at a point where the RNAs in this case could not cleave the specific protein. So we do not have the fragment. So in one case we have the different fragments and the other case we have but we are missing one fragment because the protein, the RNA binding protein had bound to that specific sequence of the RNA. So in summary we can say that we looked at the DNA and the RNA that the two types of nucleic acids in their basic structure, they were made of nucleotides that each containing a five carbon sugar backbone, phosphate group and a nitrogen base and the DNA provided the code for the specific activities of the cell while RNA converts that code into proteins in our central dogma from RNA to DNA to from DNA to RNA to protein. So the importance of protein nucleic acid interactions we saw lies in a variety of biological processes starting from DNA replication, repair, transcription, RNA processing and translation. So the importance of understanding these interactions of the nucleic acids with proteins is an extremely important process that is going to be involved in all biochemical processes involved in the formation of proteins. We looked at the types of interactions that could have been non-specific in nature or specific in nature where the sequence of the nucleotides did not matter in the non-specific types of interactions whereas in the specific types of interactions of the proteins with the nucleic acids the sequence of the nucleotides did matter in the way they interacted with the nucleic acids and these interactions could be of several types electrostatic hydrogen bonding hydrophobic and stacking interactions that could lead to structural modifications there would be the major and the minor groove interactions and we also looked at protein side chain dna rna interactions the specific dna binding domains that are important in how the protein recognizes the DNA in the helix turn helix, the zinc finger type, the leucine zipper type and the helix loop helix. Similarly, when we had RNA binding proteins, there were specific RNA recognition motifs that involved the recognition of double-stranded RNA, a K homology domain, S1 domain, a dead box domain that involved a large number of amino acid residues, a specific structural motif to them that formed the domain that was required for the specific recognition. So then we looked at the detection methods of the electrophoretic mobility shift assay, the DNA pull down assay, and in this case, the footprinting assay. These are the references. Thank you.